We hear a lot about the matching butt cheeks that are our political parties and how left and right are meaningless terms that you couldn't get a cigarette paper between the mainstream political parties on account of them having merged into one anti-human blob serving not us but the big corporations and unelected NGOs that are their paymasters. Well, it turns out the butt in question, the big fat bottom that is the authorities, is growing bigger every moment, swelling to absorb even more. By now, East and West, once confidently used as shorthand for the differences between totalitarianism and freedom, appear to be two more big flabby cheeks of the same backside. While dear old Rudyard Kipling could say East is East and West is West and never the twain shall meet, what we are treated to now is the wet sound of two great butt cheeks slapping together. Say and think what you want about Russia. Lump that country together with others you've been raised and educated to regard as enemies of democracy, if you must. Declare, if you will, that in Russia there's no meaningful democracy, that political opponents are jailed, that state censorship of dissent is complete, that the mainstream media spouts state propaganda and nothing else. Say all that about Russia and the East. But when are we going to admit to ourselves that to believe the aspirations of the leaders of the West now are in any way different than those of their counterparts in the East is nothing more than a collective act of denial of the facts? Not for the first time it's worth remembering the end of George Orwell's Animal Farm when the animals look through the windows of the farmhouse as their masters, the pigs, sit down to a meeting with their neighbouring human farmers, quote, the creatures outside looked from pig to man and from man to pig and from pig to man again, but already it was impossible to say which was which. The pigs had ultimately envied the humans, envied how they helped themselves to whatever they wanted and got things done by treating the animals like, well, like animals, while portraying themselves as somehow different and superior and therefore entitled to rule over all the animals. And in the end, they dropped all pretense and became what they had once beheld, walking, dressing and talking like those they had once professed to oppose. I don't know about anyone else, but I've long since grown tired of the pretense here in our own animal farm of the West. I'm especially fed up listening to our pigs criticise those next door as though they were different. Here it's ridiculous to suggest we have meaningful democracy via the ballot box when all the choices are the same choice as Henry Ford once said about the cars he was offering, you can have any colour you want, as long as it's black. Conservative, Labour, Liberal, SNP, take your pick. All the same, all committed to telling the rest of us what to do, while themselves getting fat on the proceeds of doing what their paymasters tell them. Their masters being the banks, the corporations, the NGOs and the intelligence agencies of the so-called West. Here in the UK, our government celebrates with a superhero kerpow style graphic, $1.5 billion to Ukraine. That's 1.5 billion cent to be laundered thousands of miles away before ending up in the already bloated accounts of the already obscenely wealthy that might have been spent helping the people of the UK, more and more of whom know the truth of that war. I mention this obscenity because it illustrates at least one way in which we in the West are actually worse than any notional villains in the East because we've evolved economies predicated on forever war, war everywhere and anywhere as long as it keeps the cash registers ringing, forever war, forever crises, populations kept always on edge. Are there any good guys anywhere? This week came the coverage of an atrocity in a theatre in Moscow, over 130 shot dead by characters the US was instantly able to identify as members of Islamist extremist group ISIS-K, being an offshoot of the same ISIS that is claimed by many to be the creature and creation of the US anyway, conjured into being to depose the regime of Bashar al-Assad in Syria. Impressive, isn't it, that the US, whose successive administrations have failed correctly to identify even those who murdered their own president, John F. Kennedy, the US, where nowadays ships accidentally knock down bridges, can nonetheless, from thousands of miles away and with absolute certainty, identify those men and their affiliation, those thugs who slaughtered innocents by the score in Russia, while simultaneously assuring us that it was absolutely nothing at all to do with Ukraine, Many and varied, not to mention credible, are the contrary voices pointing the finger of blame for the horror at Ukraine. 
and those persuading Ukraine to deny the inevitability of its defeat in that money laundering war. Intriguing too, the way so-called ISIS terrorists consistently perpetrate atrocities against enemies of the US, like Iran and China, and now Russia. Funny that. And yet here we are in the West, expected to turn a blind eye to all the ways in which any meaningful difference between our day-to-day -day reality and the traditional authoritarianism of the East has been massaged away. We're invited to clutch our pearls when shown how Vladimir Putin and others silence journalists who ask questions, far less publish criticism, while Vladimir Zelensky, great hero of Ukraine and defender of democracy, does exactly that. And you hardly need to look as far as Ukraine, given that even as I speak, the US continues aggressively to seek the scalp of Australian journalist Julian Assange, presently rotting in His Majesty's prison Belmarsh for having had the temerity to publish truth and convenience to the White House. We exist here in the bizarre, surreal universe in which Assange's legal team must seek assurances from the US that if he is finally handed over to them, that their man won't swiftly die there at American hands, in the electric chair or by lethal injection, for example, or perhaps by suicide if his guards fall asleep while the security cameras are turned off. Julian Assange published the truth, and yet even after all these years of his incarceration, it has yet to be made clear whether or not a Western regime, ally of the UK and of Australia, will reserve the right to execute him for so doing. All across the West, larger and larger numbers of citizens rise in opposition to what they see happening around them, at the behest of governments notionally elected to serve their interests. Farmers are in their tractors, not in their fields growing crops, but in the streets of one western capital city after another, demanding the right to do what they have always done, which is to feed the millions and the billions. Most recently, English farmers have made Westminster the target of their own tractor protest, not that you'd know it from the general coverage of the mainstream media, who, as in one country after another across the West, pay little in the way of meaningful attention to the needs of those who seek to feed us in the time-honoured fashion. Across Europe, the farmers' protests are defamed as the action of right-wing populist extremists. Authoritarians across the West, in the US and across Europe, have gone into overdrive in their concerted efforts to seize and maintain control of the narrative in this year that is scheduled to feature national elections in one country after another. Elections that have finally focused the attentions of the pesky people attention revealed in the form of growing support for alternative political parties that must, of course, be defamed as more right-wing populist extremism. Faced with populations grown increasingly wise to the deliberate erosion of freedom and of rights, populations waking up to the reality that their entire ways of life are targeted by regimes with aspirations that must inevitably be described as totalitarian and anti-human, Panicky politicians draft laws that might simply be described as making it illegal to disagree with them. In Scotland, on April Fool's Day as it happens, the long-dreaded and heavily criticised hate crime laws come into force. In their infinite wisdom, the SNP-led administration in Holyrood has made it illegal to, and I quote the legislation, stir up hatred. Precisely what qualifies as stirring up hatred is effectively anyone's guess. The legislation employing forms of words so vague and imprecise, so subject to interpretation and indeed abuse by whomever is empowered or invited to do so, that stirring up hatred might mean whatever the relevant authority says it does. The Dean of the Faculty of Advocates, Roddy Dunlop, is among legal experts that have warned police might be swamped by completely malicious complaints by those with political and personal scores to settle against individuals they simply don't like. Critics have described it as a disaster in the making, right up there with the SNP's now legendary failed legislation that sought to slip a so-called named person, I would say a snooping, snitching busybody, into the lives of every Scottish child, a state-sponsored interloper empowered to enter into confidences with that child without the knowledge of the parents. The looming legal farce is fronted by Scotland's First Minister Hamza Yusuf, a man who has loudly objected to white people with top jobs in a country where 96% of the population is white. And if that wasn't stirring up hatred of white people under the terms of his own act, then I don't know what is. And who has made plain his eagerness to see people criminalised even for things said in the privacy of their own homes, dare to mutter hurty words at the dinner table, and if those words are repeated, 
by your child, perhaps, within anyone's hearing, at school maybe, then the possibility of a knock at the door and challenge by uniformed officers is not out with the bounds of possibility in Scotland, land of William Wallace and supposedly immortal cries of freedom. April Fool's Day promises this new stupidity only for Scotland in the short term, but given the lockstep tendencies of the regimes of the West, the use of one small country as a petri dish for testing a given insanity in one place prior to replicating it in all the others, it's my hunch that it's hello hate crime law in Scotland today and hello everywhere else sometime soon. Always the intention is the same, to make speaking up, speaking out on any topic too risky, too much trouble for too many people. For too long, the would-be autocrats and tin-pot dictators living in the West could only dream of jack-booted totalitarianism. Now they have all but achieved the hitherto impossible and unthinkable dream of donning that gear at home for the purposes of stamping on human faces, as Orwell predicted, forever. Here's the thing. I, for one, am simply sick to death of talk of democracy where there is none, talk of freedom of speech and the First Amendment when the primary aim is to silence. Among much else, I want those petty dictators to come clean once and for all and just admit what they want, what they have all but achieved, which is the power to tell the rest of us what to do and what to think, while acknowledging there's not a damn thing we can do about it. Except, of course, there always is and always will be something we can do about it, and that's to get up in their faces and tell them precisely where to go and where, between the cheeks of that great big bottom, they can shove their nonsense.